74 and 96 years old. They all lived together in a house. And one evening, the 96-year-old sister went upstairs to take a bath. She put her foot into the tub and she paused. And then she yelled down to her other two sisters and said, was I getting in the tub or was I getting out of the tub? You darn fool, said the 94-year-old sister. I'll come up and see. So when she got halfway up the stairs, she paused. Was I going up the stairs or down? The 92-year-old sister was sitting at the kitchen table drinking a cup of tea, and she thought, I hope I never get that forgetful knock on wood. And uh, so she shook her head and called out, I'll be up to help you as soon as I see who's at the door. <laughs> You know, that's a little over the truth, but not too awful far from the truth. <laughs> we came home one time, and the phone, our fo cell phone was ringing. And we wondered, who was ringing? And there was nobody on there. We got home, and we said something to Carol's dad about ringing the phone. He said, oh, I wasn't ringing the phone. I said, what's that in your hand? And it was a phone, and he was trying to change the television. <laughs> with the cell phone. And he was, what, about 95 right then? 94. Yeah, and they were in their 90s. We had them with us for eight years, and there was a lot of laughs, you know what I mean? Because they had the ability to laugh, you know, with each other, and <laughs> she was wondering one time why her, why her sweatpants were so long, and she had his sweatpants on. <laughs> And she was a little short when he was a really tall, and she had his pants on. I don't know how she got him to stay up, but she was remember that. <laughs> and they just laughed. You got you got to laugh. There has to be a little humor in everything, honestly. But we have a lot of things to make us afraid, to make us worried. A lot of things that we have. And some people are overwhelmed by the worry that they don't have any joy. Even Christian people are so, I mean, we have so many things, this nasty virus. And my next door neighbor is a physical therapist at the VA hospital, and he told me last week there were so many COVID patients in the Altoona Hospital COVID wing that they were sending some over to the VA hospital. And we used to hear about all these illnesses when, it, when the first round of COVID came through. But there's just as many that you just don't hear it now. It's not big news. And some people are dying from it. You know, like that lady and her son. Shocker. But we've all been touched by it. In a church of only 20, we've had 10 people have had it that I know of. Three were in a hospital. Thank God two of them have been released. John and Bob. And I said before, I believe we prayed them out of there. I really do. And one still remains, Susan, and we need to pray her out of there too. And another thing is the stuff that's going on in the country here, and the stuff that's going on in Washington. And the rest of the country, there's plenty of things to be concerned about, to be worried about. Socialism is being embraced in our schools and especially on the colleges. Socialism and its big brother Marxism are ungodly movements. You know, they don't believe in private property. They, they, they consider any and all religion the enemy to them. They, even the nuclear family they don't believe in a nuclear family. BLM publishes that. They don't believe in a nuclear family. But God does, because he set it up that way. They consider the nuclear family to be racist. And I can just shake my head. One of the most hideous things in our schools, hideous, I'm, I'm talking hideous, is they're encouraging kids, and I don't know if it has to happen in all schools, but as young as five to question their gender. Are you really a boy? Are you really? I know that some of that was going on in Holidaysburg. 
Are you really? Question their gender. It's little kids, five and five and eight years old, and they and and if there's a, sh a sign that they may not be what they look like, they start giving them. In some places, eight years old, they start giving them puberty blockers, medication. Eight years, and it's dangerous. I read a report from a pediatrician that said this should not be. This is dangerous. And Sweden outlawed it. One of the most progressive liberal countries in the world. They outlawed that. But we're still doing it. It's hideous. Gender treatments in little kids. And then when they're 18, they get mutilated. And this is our country where we live. Trying to turn men into women and women into men. It's hideous. Yeah. Walt Smith got a charge out of that. <laughs> I told them, I said, these people make me beg for amens. Here's how I beg. <laughs> God made them male and female. God made them. So we have lots of things to be worried about. Amen? Border security has been abandoned. We can't take care of the whole world. There's no attempt to control the border. And then we in this country alone have murdered 63 million unborn children. Listen to this. One out of every 66 deaths in the world is an American abortion. One out of every 66 worldwide deaths is an American abortion. One out of every four deaths in this country is an abortion. Did you know that? One out of every four deaths in this country is an abortion. Half of all the deaths in the world are from abortions. Did you know that? Abortion is the leading cause of death in the world kills as many people as all the other causes of death combined. That's a fact. We've lost more Americans through abortion, 64 times more than we did of all of the wars, 12 wars combined. Cause for concern? God will surely judge 63 million murdered innocents. We live in a country where people consider abortion a sacred right. God help us. Gay marriage. And they're getting and they're being married by in a church by a minister. So we have plenty of things to be concerned about, to worry about. Inflation, price of gas. Price of food. Are we going to have a turkey? Price of ammo. Some people won't be able to afford food if this continues. Price to heat your home this winter. The powers that be are trying to destroy the fossil fuel industry, which is the way we can afford to heat. Plenty of things to cause us to be concerned, to worry about. We worry about paying the bills of the church. We worry about having church. I canceled church because there would only be this many. And I wasn't going to cancel it again. Just because of a few numbers. We, I mean, we didn't have anybody, you know, to, to lead the worship. But Carol steps up and picks some songs. And she did a good job of that. A very good job of that. Things were looking bright under the previous administration. Now it seems that like the country is in a steep decline. Plenty of things to worry about. But the scripture counsels us not to be afraid. Not to worry. Joshua 1.9. 
Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord is, or your Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. There's a negative and a positive in there. Do not be discouraged. Do not. That's a negative. And be strong. That's a positive. Fear and discouragement don't just go away. They need to be replaced with strength and courage. I'm going to say it again. Fear and discouragement don't just go away. They need to be replaced with strength and courage. According to that scripture. Amen. Fear and discouragement come from the world. And who is the God of this world? Amen. Strength comes from God. And he's our God. Isaiah 41 10. So do not fear for I am with you. No matter what you see happening in Washington, D.C., no matter what food the prices are, no matter about, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, even if there's a virus. I don't mind telling you that I get dismayed. I'll confess that. I get discouraged. Actually, the only thing that really gets to me is when things aren't going well in this church. I, you know, I have to admit that it was discouraging when a couple of families left the church. It was discouraging. But I'm encouraged by Boyd. That's so encouraging that somebody comes and comes and comes and stays gives testimony and God, how God has blessed him and touched him. It was a sign. He saw the sign. He said, you know, I need to get back in church. I'm encouraged. He wasn't, he didn't see the handful of people and think I'll go somewhere else. I said, you come back, we will love you. <laughs> and we do. I talk to him just about every day. So he's been a blessing to us and we're a blessing to him. And that's the way it works. That's the way it's supposed to be. He's an encouragement, at least to me, as we bless each other and we encourage each other. That's what a good church does. Amen. That's what a good church does. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus advises us not to worry about three things, all personal things. Life, nourishment, and clothing. Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34 says this. Therefore I tell you, not, do not worry about your life. Is that easy? No, it's not. There's plenty of things to make us worry. The older we get, the more worried we get. Because we have kids and grandkids to worry about besides just ourselves but this is what he said do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes and verse 26 look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in barns and let your head and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more va va valuable than they? We have a value to God himself. We're valuable to him. So instead of dwelling, it's a good word, dwelling, on the problems that we face, that we have, we're facing surgery, we're facing gas prices and viruses instead of dwelling on those problems allowing this to make us afraid there are many of those things we should instead be dwelling on the goodness of God dwelling on it not just acknowledging that God that God is good to us but being consumed with that goodness dwelling on the goodness of God 
We have a God in heaven who gave us life, who loves us and cares for us, sent his son to die for us, and has a place in heaven for us. In comparison, the mundane things that we worry about are minuscule if we just keep dwelling on the goodness of God. We still have our problems. Sometimes there's a new one comes up every day. But the awesome prospect of spending eternity with Him in heaven has to outweigh all of our problems. Verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? <laughs> well, we do it. <laughs> Our worry doesn't accomplish anything. You can't worry yourself out of a problem. You can't worry yourself out of a virus. You can't worry yourself to a lower gas price. It doesn't accomplish anything. Worry doesn't solve anything. It doesn't help anything. Matter of fact, worrying can be harmful to you. It, it, the stress can cause illness, can cause symptoms, can cause you to have joint pains and shortness of breath. And Worrying can cause physical symptoms and discomfort. Really it can. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So stop worrying, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So he's talking about little faith and much worry. If you're in a much worry category, then you have little faith. That's what it says. And we live in a world of pagans. But it's not us. Jesus gives us the antidote for worry in verse 33. Where it says, but seek first his kingdom. I know you know this verse. And his righteousness and all these things will given to you, be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's the antidote for stress and concern and worry. Seek first, or first seek first the priority of the life of the believer has to be seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven seeking both the kingdom on earth and the one that is to come the object of our seeking make heaven our goal Aim life toward the kingdom of heaven. You know, you can aim your life one way or another. Press toward it. Seek for the glory, the honor, the immortality, and the fellowship we will have with God. We can have fellowship now, but we see through a glass darkly. We don't know what that's going to be like, but it's going to be totally awesome. Words can't describe it. This life is brief and transitory. And though we were immersed in it physically, our seeking, our heart, should be wrapped around the glory that is to come. We must seek the things of God more than our own things. If, if they come into competition, we got to remember to which we are to give priority. I can convince myself that I need another fly rod, but I really don't. I can convince myself I need another handgun. I only have two hands. 
I could talk myself into that. Seeking his righteousness and his kingdom and seeking God. I can convince myself that I need to spend $50 for roast beef. There was two, two, big, two big ones like in a pack at Sam's. It was $46. I can convince myself that I need to spend $46 for those two big bros in there. I didn't do it. But I might still. <laughs> well, I freeze one and, you know, and when we have roast beef soup and everything afterwards, and then those, things, those are good, chuck roast. It's expensive. I can convince myself that I need to do that. And then it says, seek his righteousness. God's righteousness is his holiness. His, it's his right way. It's an objective truth about him and about the world. His righteousness is to be sought that we conform to it and live by it and not by the standards of the world. The effect of seeking his righteousness is to live out the righteousness of Christ, which is given to us freely. We have the imputation, that means put on the righteousness of Christ. Why? Because we don't have any that counts to God. So he gives us his as a covering. Given to us freely by his perfect life and death on the cross for our sins. Ours is to repent and believe, calling on the name of the Lord. And then bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. The, those things then, he says, will be added to you as well. All these things will be given to you as well. Seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness is a full-time job. If you don't have it a full-time job, then, then the world is going to creep in. And then fear is going to creep in. We don't have the time, energy, mental capacity, especially me, to also worry about all what they call all these things. That's what the world does. That's what the pagans worry about. And it's a dead end, literally. A dead end. Part of the problem of unbelief is to be never satisfied and to be always anxious for more than you have. God rescues us from that when we turn to his kingdom and to his righteousness. God knows what we need. But what we, you know... What we want may not be what we need. <laughs> we convince ourselves that I need that. But we really don't. God knows what we really need. He knows what we need. And everything that we get is a blessing. If we honor God as the one who provided everything that we have. Honor God. God doesn't owe us anything. Life is hard. But God is good. You can't out hard the goodness of God. We are His. We belong to Him. We are His people. He paid a heavy price for ownership in us. He has ownership in you. You need to honor that. And He will take care of us. But he does it in his time and his way. If he had our way, things would just be a certain way. But we have to trust him. And verse 34 says, do not worry. Be happy. We win. Read the end of the book. We win. Revelations 15, 13. I'm going to close with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for this small gathering. 
We trust you with all of our hearts that this gathering is going to grow as those who are stricken come back and as new people come in. We trust you, Lord, to do that. We know you do things according to your will and your time, and we and we yield to that, Lord. We yield to it. We give it up to you, Lord, because we can't do it, and we, and we know that you can. And so we trust you with everything, Lord, with all of our, with our church, with our bills, with our trials and tribulations and difficulties. We trust you. We, get, we just give it all to you, Lord. Turn it over to you. And we will not be in fear. We'll be trusting and hoping and dwelling in the goodness of God instead of the fear of the things that are taking place that we see around us, Lord. So help us to do that, Lord. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not, but help us. Be there with us to help us. Stay in joy and in the goodness of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.